Okay, welcome everybody. My name's uh, Michael Keith. I'm the head of uh, Compass, the Migration Study Centre, two doors down. But, um, I'm also with uh, Steve Rayner, the co-director of the Future of Cities programme, which is hosting uh, this evening. So um, thanks to the Research Fellows team who did the logistics and organisation for tonight from, the, from that team, but also I want to welcome you to our lecturer tonight, who is uh, Thomas Blom Hansen, whose work I'm sure uh, many of you will know already and have read and used for the various programmes that I see represented in the, in the room today. Um, Thomas is the Reliance Sirabana Ambani uh, Professor of South Asian Studies at Stanford in the Anthropology Department. Um, so Thomas's work has carried out extensive and pioneering uh, research, particularly in India, in Mumbai, but also in interrogating theoretically issues around sovereignty, around migration, around status, uh, in ways which are, I think speak powerfully to the interests of many of the people in the room, many of the courses, uh, and interests of graduate students in Oxford. Uh, today, uh, Thomas is going to speak to us about the sacred and the city, how religious identity shapes urban life. Um, I'm not sure how much it connects with the book uh, that's just out recently, Melancholia of Freedom, Anxiety, Race and Everyday Life in a South African Township. But Thomas uh, has explained to me when we met, I think it's a year or so ago, uh, uh, an abiding interest in urban studies because I think Thomas believes that much of the urban has been misrepresented or misconceptualized and will take Zimbal as a starting point to take, uh, to take Zimbal south, I guess. So if there's a, a door, there would be a, bri a, bridge, a bridge to the south, maybe. But uh, with, uh, with that very brief introduction, uh, if we could uh, just welcome uh, Thomas and then he will speak to us for 50 minutes or so and then there'll be time for questions afterwards. So, Thomas, please. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Well, thanks, Michael, and thanks for this uh, opportunity to come to uh, wintry Oxford. Uh, <coughs> uh, uh, I've had a great time meeting a lot of old friends, so, it's, so it's, a, it's a great opportunity also. Thanks for all of you for coming today. So um, I should say that this is, I pitched my talk. Uh, 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 I can see various people who are in anthropology and probably from many disciplines and so on. So I pitched my uh, I should say that I, this talk is sort of pitched to a sort of what I would call an, a, a sort of urban studies uh, crowd. So there will be moments of, of strong recognition from, for some of you uh, and moments of uh, where you think, do I really have to uh, have this uh, basic anthropology repeated to me? But uh, uh, so, so I'm, I'm trying to cover uh, various uh, grounds here, which is, of course, one of the exciting things about doing urban studies. It's one of these places where you... Uh, meet, there, uh, there's a lot of different interests and disciplines meeting, and, and uh, that's what we need, uh, I think, more than ever. So I'll just let these people come in, and then we can start. So let me begin with a little uh, story uh, that some, some weeks ago I was uh, chatting with some colleagues who were involved in urban studies at various places in California. And like uh, most of these programs uh, in California in, and in the U.S. and indeed also in Europe, uh, these are overwhelmingly focused on U.S. cities or, or Western cities and general urban theory derived from that. Uh, and I was mentioning that I was writing a lecture to go to Oxford and talk about the sacred and the city. And they looked politely confused. Uh, one of them asked, so is this a talk about India or something like that, some other exotic location where... A, a title like that would be appropriate. And when I said, well, I wanted to make some more general and theoretical points, this politeness gave way to decided skepticism, let's say. So let me begin from that point. I think it's fair to say that urban sociologists and anthropologists largely, and some of you may want to protest this point, have followed the logic of 19th century sociological thought when it comes to the city. Social phenomena belong to two realms, either Gemeinschaft or Gesellschaft, and religious practice was indeed the very heart of traditional and small-scale societies, whose proper place remained the village or the small town, pervaded by customary culture, suffused with what Durkheim uh, termed the conscience collective. By contrast, the industrial commercial city was seen as the site of 
pure modernity, where individuation, alienation, new forms of instrumental social relations grew, and where the mundane routines of industrial time burned away and displaced traditional mores and certainties. New divisions of labor and functional differentiations created new solidarities, and religious cosmology would give way to a new fetish of the individual, or as Durkheim had it, as all other beliefs and all other practices take on a character less and less religious, the individual becomes the object of a sort of religion, he writes in The Division of Labor. So this is a sort of the standard thing that we all know, that we've all been taught in the industry, commercialization, modern bureaucracy, own rhythms and authority structures that were largely independent of religious sanction and morality. And the religious impulse now assumed new forms, as we know. Uh, in Weber, it became a kind of ethics that became instrumental rationality. In Durkheim, it became uh, 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 the function was to uh, unite different moralities under some kind of shared canopy, and so on. And colonial culture and the scientific authority of evolutionary thought at the time only reinforced this mental construct within anthropology and well beyond. The distinction between the modern differentiated rationalized life in urban areas as categorically different from that of a rural tradition based on an integrated holistic customary culture was mapped directly onto, as we know, administrative classifications, townsmen versus tribesmen, traditional rule and cultural purity vested in traditional leaders uh, versus the deracinated, unstable, unmoored character of the new urban proletariat in slums, bidonvilles, and favelas. In colonial Africa, cities were supposed to be detribalized, while the rural areas became subjected to a much firmer rule uh, under appointed chiefs and tribal heads. So this early anthropology, mostly based on, on African material, it was the transformation of tribal identities in urban settings that were of primary interest. Interestingly, when you look through the work of the, the Manchester School and the whole uh, 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 bunch of work coming out of what is today Zambia, religion didn't feature as a separate category or very interesting category in classical studies such as Epstein's study of, of the mining town Broken Hill from 1958, or on Clyde Mitchell's work on the Kalela dance, or on his later work on social networks in the Copper Belt. Religion was here entirely, or almost entirely, subsumed within a broader cultural cosmology. The interest of this generation of anthropologists was in how urban life and new disciplines of work transformed cultural practices and attachment into ethnic identities that were at once more superficial and more important than before. In mining towns, ethnicity was not tantamount to deep filiations and fine-tuned obligations as in the rural areas, but more superficial, if still effective, markers of identity and difference transacted through stereotypes, jokes, and other things. However, the distinction between the urban and the rural as a deep moral gulf between the proper of the countryside and the improper of the town still remained an enduring matrix in most urban studies of the time. Or as Glockman, Max Glockman wrote in a canonical article from 1960, an African townsman is a townsman, an African miner is a minor, he is only secondarily a tribesman. This distinction, and I belabor this point a little bit for reasons that have become clear afterwards, uh, drew sustenance from colonial policies as well as from landmark essays in sociology and anthropology at the time. One was Louis Worth's uh, 1938 essay, Urbanism as a Way of Life, that emphasized the segmental and transitory character of urban life a sociality relying mostly on secondary rather than primary contacts, presuming that the primary contacts was the stuff that happened in the village or outside the city. Um, another was, of course, Robert Redfield's uh, also canonical 1947 essay, Folk Society, that depicted the life of towns and villages as that of little traditions and older local moral registers that stood opposed to the, uh, the anonymous life in the modern metropolis. If we go to other classic studies, such as Philip Meyer's classic study of, uh, of migrants going to Port Elizabeth townsmen or tribesmen from 1961, he demonstrates here that this distinction between the red people, the traditionalist, and the school people, the westernized, mapped onto the rural and urban distinction quite clearly, 
as two starkly opposed moral social registers of conduct. To Maya, ritual practice and Christianity was, were involved on both sides of this divide, but the more radical calls for discarding tradition altogether came from modern heterogeneous ch Christian churches in the city. In a very similar vein, the urban milieu and its new demands for replacing traditional kinship obligations with strong horizontal ethnic ties became the midwife for a new form of religious organization in urban Nigeria. As shown by Abner Cohn, what appeared to be retribalization at first was in fact nothing but a new phenomenon, the organization of Hausa identity as a political force articulating through the uh, Tijania Muslim Brotherhood, a trans-regional organization that gave Hausa traders political clout and expanding economic opportunity. Today, as you may know, such tradition, uh, transnational religious organizations can, uh, of, of a different kind, of a much bigger and global kind, connect Hausa traders with Senegal, Egypt, Cape Town, and, and much further afield. So if we look at this sort of background, if we move to another part of the world dominated what was once called the religions of civilization, the city was here the site of literal literate and abstract great traditions residing in more formalized institutions. In the Muslim world and across South Asia and Southeast Asia, rulers had for centuries made cities and towns into sites of performance of both ritual and secular power. Such cities of splendor, and of course, especially the holy cities such as Jerusalem, Qom, Mecca, Benares, and others were celebrated as places of great learning and refinement, but also city, the city was also in this cultural imagination seen as a place full of decadence and moral deprivation. In both the Mu Muslim, the Buddhist, and the Hindu tradition, the splendor and beauty of the holy city always existed in attention with the purity of the more rustic but also more authentic tradition, the Hindu sages and shrines in the hills, the great Sufi saints in the countryside, uh, and the peers of the rural hinterland, the forest monks, and so on. This changed, interestingly, with the coming of colonial rule, at least to some extent. Now these cities were conceptualized as sites of a decaying tradition, symbolized by their dense and overcrowded and unhygienic medinas and kasbahs, crumbling mosques and temples. Colonial cities from Fez, Cairo, Beirut, to Delhi, Hyderabad, and Lucknow were now doubled by new modern colonial towns replete with administrative buildings, parade grounds, and geometrically laid out uh, streets, squares, parks, and clock towers. Dale Eichelman, who studied the transformation of the holy city of Boujad in uh, Morocco, wrote, uh, French policy, and I quote, French policy created three zones for traditional, one for traditional Moroccans, one for evolved or modern Moroccans, and one for Europeans. Each zone was presumed to correspond exactly to the mentality of certain elements of these populations, unquote. It was clear that religion here would play different roles in these different zones of the colonial city. Folk deities and traditional practices were generally assumed to persist in the old city and in the slums brim brimming with new urbanites. It was the modern part of the city, whether European or modern native, that was assumed to embody a certain cosmopolitan flavor uh, and modern institutions. And interestingly, colonial cities were never, even at the time, <coughs> assumed to be anywhere close to secular or secularizing in the sense that classical sociology attributed to the large industrial city in Europe or the United States. Colonizers were seen as Christians and they behaved like it. Churches, clubs for Europeans only, Christian organizations, convent schools, and many other institutions abounded in the new city spaces of the colonial world. Similarly, the new native elites set up dense networks of schools, clubs, associations, mostly based on existing community ties and affiliations, most often based on modernist religious reform agendas that produced new and austere forms of Islam, modern reformed Hindu movements, and what has been called by Obisekara uh, a modern Protestant Buddhism. Anthropologists of South Asia noted early on that the colonial urban spaces indeed were modern, at least parts of it, but they were also marked by reli religious activism and civic associations of many kinds. These were large, heterogeneous, and deeply segmental uh, cities, but precisely not dominated by the secondary contacts and anonymity 
as in Louis, Louis, Louis Worth's uh, version of urbanity. Anthropologist David Pocock argued as early as 1960, when these studies were done in the Copper Belt and elsewhere in Africa, that Indian cities did not conform with Louis Worth's uh, model of a thinning of ethno-social ties, quite on the contrary. Instead, Pocock asserted, it was only, in fact only in the city that the very detailed spatial and institutional segmentation of communities in every detail could be achieved. The, this, the very stable of the Hindu social order, only here could it flourish and realize itself as evidenced in older Indian cities such as Surat or Banaras. Now this little, I just start with this brief overview of some of the existing literature to make clear that there is a deep tradition of conceptualizing religion as somehow antithetical or alien or external to modern uh, urban life. And this had a long and agenda setting uh, existence in anthropology and in sociology. But there was also, of course, as I indicated, rich evidence that strained against the limits of this uh, uh, thesis. <coughs> Urban anthropology was born in colonial Africa and never really seemed to fit very well into other zones of the colonial world where, with old cities and religions of civilization. The other major problem in this enduring intellectual model was that it, there was also overwhelming evidence against it in the modern Western city. The modern industrial city was never anywhere near to be a secular space in, in any meaningful way, but always awash with all kinds of religious groupings, institutions, missionaries, and many of them, of course, working outside the organized edifice of religious institutions. Let me quote one of the most famous uh, assertions of this, uh, where Jean and John Comer have pointed out, what, uh, pointed to what they call the dialectic of domesticity, where they show that non-conformist Christian preachers and missionaries from Britain were engaged in simultaneous efforts to create proper and moral homes and domestic disciplines among the working class of the northern cities of England, as well as moral and proper homes and individuals on the colonial frontier. It's difficult to overemphasize the depth of worry, of skepticism, and so on that characterized debates about the modern industrial metropolis in Europe and America in the late 19th century. The new urban proletariat was widely regarded as unstable, deracinated, at the verge of returning to a semi-savage and anomic state. Uh, in fact, there is also more recent work that's shown that one of the reasons for, uh, uh, there was a great deal of worry about also recruitment of uh, troops, soldiers for, uh, armies uh, both in, in France and in, 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 uh, in Britain uh, in the working class uh, segments or, or at that time uh, the, the whole idea of urban degeneracy was very very prominent um, and, and dominated much uh, di discussion at the time. The emergence of sociological and psychological theories of crowd behavior, crowd pathologies from Gustave Le Bon, Gabriel Tard, Freud and others was just one symptom of the fear of the social pathology and degeneracy of populations and social mores in the large metropolitan area, areas in the Western world. In America, the burgeoning cities were seen as imminent social catastrophes as the combined waves of impoverished immigrants from Eastern and Southern Europe, often, as we know, regarded as white but not quite, uh, and millions of emancipated African Americans made their way towards the major cities in the north, uh, or what, is, uh, what was the northern states, uh, still is the northern states. This triggered major racial and ethnic tension and marked the beginning of an unprecedented level of activism and missionizing by many groups and movements in New York, Philadelphia, Chicago, and virtually every major city in the U.S. Some of these activities were driven by very strong anti-Catholic sentiments, largely forgotten today. Um, others by the temper temperance movement, and others again by attempts to organize and galvanize communities along ethno-religious and racial lines, as shown in rich detail by the, the, in the work of, uh, of Robert Orsi. This dynamic was, of course, even more pronounced in the large colonial and post-colonial cityscapes at the same time where religion historically played and continues to play a huge but often underestimated role. At times, religion was articulated alongside with mobilization of cultural and ethnic identities. 
to take one well-known example that's close to my heart, the creation of the annual Ganesh festival in Bombay in the 1890s by Bal Gangara Tilak, a conservative Hindu and early nationalist, is a good example of a mass public spectacle that was both a public display of religious sentiment and community among Hindus, but also anti-colonial, pitched against the colonial power, defying colonial uh, regu regulation, and also anti-Muslim, despite actually borrowing its basic format on it and its aesthetic form from the Shia Muharram festival. Today, this mass spectacle has become the very signature event of uh, Mumbai, one of the largest religious festivals in the world, and every bit as, uh, as unsettling of inter-community coexistence as it was back in the 1890s. At other times, religion was articulated in its own right as a moral force that could be mobilized as a bulwark against the imputed immorality of urban life and excesses of modernity, like Orsi showed in America. Here, to give you a few examples, the formation of the reformist Muslim organizations such as the M Muslim Brotherhood in urban Egypt, or Tablighi Jamaat later in the 1920s in co co colonial um, uh, South Asia, or the Hindu nationalist movement in India, as well as also, you could say, much of Gandhi's thinking and political practice. At other times, broad religious symbols became temporary axes of identification and solidarity among diverse com communities, pitching them against an enemy community in violent clashes, staged mainly in urban spaces. The historically deep and enduring rift between Muslims and Hindus in India is, of course, a case in point. But the re recurrent and escalating clashes today and the last 30 years between Hausa-speaking Muslims and Yoruba-speaking Christians in the cities of northern Nigeria is another instance of this pattern, but with a different history, of course. These clashes may not be about the city in a strict sense, but like urban ethnicity, they take strongly spatial forms, imply strong and enduring marking of territories and boundaries, and they are fought along lines of culturally thin but effective and flexible filiations of otherwise disparate groups. Uh, these are filiations that are created more by the contiguity of ethno-religious uh, others and communities than by any deep camaraderie or sympathies with any of your co-religionists -relig necessarily. As I've argued in my earlier work on India, Deep ethno-religious divisions in everyday urban life are, in fact, more effects of such violent clashes than their initial cause as such. The perverse outcome of such enduring and recurring conflicts is, in other words, that they precisely tend to produce their own ostensibly natural cause, the very enduring enmity and social spatial separation. So it's a kind of uh, vicious cycle. In all of these cases, religious institutions, identities, sentiments were deeply involved in the very making of urban space. They continue to leave deep marks on the structure of urban political and social conflicts and distinct experiences of urban space, architecture and soundscapes. Yet, and I'll come back to this in a little while, this nexus between religious identity and urban experience has rarely been a theme that's guided scholarship in urban anthropology or other social sciences for that matter. Scholarship on religious phenomena, work on urbanity in urban cultures have often, as it were, happened along two parallel but rarely intersecting or cross-fertilizing lines. I think there are two obvious obstacles, which are basically two forms of conventional thinking and also methodological uh, sort of uh, uh, habits, you might say. On one hand, the study of organized religion of any kind continues to be thought of as a separate, or think of religion as a separate domain of life with its own institutions, with its ethical injunctions that only incidentally touches or impacts on the general economic or even political life of cities, ordinary people. These are, of course, uh, this is not true of people who work on religious, social, social religious movements that spill over directly have a political program, but the sort of the classical studies of religious practice uh, often take, take that as a <coughs> point of departure. Those who study religion often focus on specific rituals or specific movements, institutions, and congregations. And these are, of course, ready-made and well de delineated fora and objects that often prove welcoming to the visiting ethnographer or social scientists. 
On the other hand, those who study urban life or urban communities tend to focus on all the pressing everyday concerns that people talk about, livelihoods, housing, resistance to urban reform, transformation of gender roles, and so on. And religious concerns often here appear somewhat incidental to such general issues that in many cases also are shared across religious boundaries. I'm not saying that I, any of these assumptions necessarily are wrong or misguided, but the net result is nonetheless a continuous separation of religion and city life. However, I think we may well be missing some dimensions of how religion and religious identities shape what urban experience and urban aspiration may look like for many people across the world. So let me uh, veer into some examples in the sort of anthropology uh, habit of presenting little vignettes. Let me begin with the story of, so, so I see a former colleague from Edinburgh here, with the story of the Edinburgh Mosque. I don't know if any of you know that mosque, but it's sitting just next to the university where I worked for a good number of years. It served as a community, uh, it served a community mainly of, of South Asian origin. It was completed in 1988 with the help of money from the King Fahd Foundation and is carefully designed in the brown and yellowish color, colors that mark the entire city. These and the architectural designs were mandated by the city planning department, as was the height of the minaret, which was not allowed to come anywhere near the height of any of the rather grand churches dotting the Edinburgh skyline. The mosque's website depicts the building in the following way. This is a, and I quote, a stunning castle-like building which blends in well with the historic monuments. It combines traditional Islamic features with some Scots baronial, whatever that is. It blends rather nicely, I remember a Scottish newspaper agent near the mosque would tell me. He, like many others, had nothing but praise for the local Muslim community and their conduct. These are not your fanatical Muslims that you read about in the papers. They're just following their tradi tradition from back home, was a common sentiment I heard, and I'm sure many of you in the, have, who know Edinburgh have heard over and over again. The notion of religion as a form of ethnicity, or embedded in ethnicity, and indeed, a form of praiseworthy and wholesome tradition grounded in far-flung villages of Pakistan or India uh, had now settled as a common sense that one encounters in many an immigrant-friendly circle in city councils and in associations. Integration problems, including fanatical attachments to religion, were essentially generated by the shock of modernity in urban environments. This argument still goes and would, of course, resolve itself, resolve itself once migrants had become proper townsmen, as it were. The mosque was indeed, and in the keeping with this, a form of shop front for the most benign and agreeable facets of South Asian culture. The most popular initiative was, and it's still there, the opening of the mosque kitchen that served large quantities of Punjabi food uh, at student-friendly prices to hundreds of customers each day. The retired men who I chatted with on a regular basis, who ran the kitchen as a form of religious duty that generated also substantial income for the mosque, did not see themselves as traditional rustics slowly adapting to an urban mentality, including an appropriate aesthetic appreciation of the Scots baronial style, whatever that may mean. Several of them came from major cities in Pakistan, and their idea of what a proper mosque should look like was more influenced by classical architecture of South Asia and the Middle East, white marble, green roofs, ornate tiles, and so on. For these men, the fact and the size of the mosque itself and their determined efforts to build relations with the city and their neighbors was all aimed at making space for themselves as modern Muslims, as people who also enjoyed a certain right to the city, although I'm pretty certain that Henri Lefebvre and other militantly secular French Marxists would be horrified by the idea that a mosque could be a vehicle for such a claim. Anyway, we, we st let's keep that to one side, and they were in fact successful, have been successful in staking this claim as a, to a, a certain right to the city, and are now a stable part of the highlights during the Edinburgh Festival. One of their running jokes, I remember, was nonetheless that a properly white mosque in bright colors would have cheered up the grayness of the city and its towering church spires a little bit. Another example. As the peripheries of many Indian cities develop at a breakneck speed, the central parts of the older metropolitan areas feel almost feel much quieter and at times almost stayed. In Mumbai, heritage walks and architecture has become the latest craze and the new way of marketing the city. 
There are, of course, Slumdog Tours by Reality Tours Incorporated to Dharavi, also known as Asia's largest slum, where one can behold the ingenuity and survival skills of the natives in their natural environment as if they were in some form of reservation, which may not be far off the mark. Uh, and there are also walks that take in the beauty of the old colonial buildings in the city. This urban nostalgia, and as we know, nostalgia is an essential part of how modern cities are packaged and presented, you just have to look outside the window here, um, has also spread to activist circles. Here, the nostalgic object is now the vanished working class of the city and the now defunct mill district where new high rises are sprouting every month. A friend of mine, college-educated, former activist in a trade union, although never a mill worker himself, wanted to create an alternative walking tour to the tour mainstream tourist tours. He didn't want to do a heritage walk of that kind, but he wanted to expose tourists to the true history of Bombay, as he said, real reality tourism. He wanted to try it out on me. He asked me if that was OK. I said, sure. The tour began for there might be a few people who are familiar with, with Bombay, in Girgaon, the old heart of the working class district, and today a completely Marathi-speaking uh, stronghold of the Shiv Sena that I had written about early on, the city's dominant nativist political force. We proceeded past the large railway station of Bombay Central, the terminus that had served for many years the mill district, and made our way into Madanpura, Nagpara, now Muslim-dominated areas, ending in Baikala, the historical heart of the city's native Christian communities from Goa and the Anglo-Indian community. As we walked, my friend tried out his tour guide narrative on me, providing a compelling and interesting story on the evolution and decline of the mill district and the working class, its popular life, its, uh, its spirit and its many institutions, or mostly defunct by now, Akaras, that is, uh, uh, place, uh, gymnasiums, or wrestling pits, eateries, libraries, and so on. As we walk through this terrain that I know so well, where I have done field work for a long time, I couldn't help noticing how much my friend also left out. Girgaon was dotted with various temples and small shrines under trees, while Madanpura and Nagpara were full of mosques, madrasas, as well as older Christ Christian institutions, from the Salvation Army to large, well-maintained churches. Today, these districts are more sharply segregated uh, from an, uh, one another than, uh, than ever before after decades of conflicts, especially between Hindus and Muslims. But the historical lines and patterns are of much longer historical standing. Where my friend saw a unified working class culture, I tended to see a landscape into which people and religious community for generations had tried to leave marks built uh, monuments, small, mostly small, um, and define themselves and c cultivate certain forms of life. Both of us were right, of course, in some sense, uh, but my question is, can one really understand the way a city like that develops without understanding these historical structures and memories? I don't think so. Can all these areas be gentrified? and easily be subjected to the movements of capital and speculation described so cogently by Neil Smith in, in, for, in his study of Chicago or elsewhere? I don't think so. What looks like a general gentrification of the city from, uh, from afar uh, is only taking place in select lands, some of the former middle lands, while much of the rest of the area remains locked into rent-controlled properties or zones so deeply identified with specific communities that they're not easily convertible into something else. Most of the new high-rises in these areas cater precisely to the people who feel comfortable there. In Girgaon and sim similar areas, one sees an influx of mostly middle-class Hindu families occupying new high-rises. While in Baikola, there are many Christians and also South Indian Hindus who assiduously try to stay out of the intense communal conflicts in the city. Much fewer high-rises come up in the poorer Muslim areas but in those that do exist, such as the delicately named pink 30-story uh, building named La Vue, uh, residents are almost exclusively more well-to-do Muslims. So as religious community has become, you can say, more symbolically thin and simplified in some ways, I'll come back to the thinness in a second, uh, 
It has also become more intensely defined in terms of space and fear. And it has, in fact, become more intense experience in defining the practical and compelling experience in, time, in terms of defining the practical parameters of everyday urban life, where you walk, where you shop, where you work, and where you can live. I should say it's very difficult for people to be outside, to get outside of these areas uh, that are already defined by religious identities. My final example comes from my more recent work in the former town Indian township of Chatsworth in Durban. Here, the apartheid planners had carefully laid out plots of land designated for religious institutions uh, that were deemed to be of specific uh, importance for people of South Asian origin. But for decades, many of those plots were vacant or underused. After the end of apartheid, a cons conspicuous religious revival has gripped the whole township and adjacent areas and many other parts of the country. Now, old industrial buildings and cinema halls are turned into mega churches, Pentecostal tent missions abound, and smaller old temples and mosques built by earlier generations of more modest means are now replaced by gleaming new structures often make, marking their presence by loud sonic means, amplified asans, temple and church bells, amplified singing of hymns, bhajans, and so on. These phenomena give rise to new forms of pride and also new misgivings. A volunteer in the temple that uh, had just erected a 40 feet tall statue of Hanuman told me recently how, how he now felt really proud to be a Hindu. He said to me, previously, we were made to feel ashamed of our heritage. But now we're free to say our forefathers built this area and made it what it is today. They were Hindus and they would have been proud of what we do today." Unquote. Unquote. The force of the sentiment was of course directed at many local Hindus, especially those of a lower class social, uh, a lower social class and also lower caste. Those who more often convert to evangelical Christianity and, of course, also directed at the conspicuous presence of many new churches in the area. The Pentecostal preachers there were clear and unambiguous in identifying the Hindu gods and their abodes, the temples, as nothing but the work of the devil, institutions and influences that they had devoted themselves to remove from the life of their flock and from the township as a whole. Local Muslim clerics more cautiously encouraged the Muslims in, their, in the areas to send their children to some of the proliferating Muslim schools and to move to areas with other Muslims in order to make sure that their families were exposed to what they would call more healthy and clean lifestyles. These contestations of space as religious territory as marked by religion and older racial demarcations, of course, had direct consequences for how the real estate market in that area worked. An acquaintance of mine who, like many others, had lost his job, was now dabbling in real estate, uh, brokerage, real estate brokerage in the township and at its fringes. He told me that all his customers were Indian, like himself, and as he said, no white person ever tries to buy here. He also told me that the proximity to a temple, to a mosque or a church, now has become a major consideration for people buying houses. No Christian will buy next to the temple or the mosque, they think they'll get affected by the power or the spirits in there, he says. And similarly, many Hindus would complain about the loud singing and music from makeshift churches. The feeling of being, defined by the, being defiled by the presence of Christians was strong, especially among the many upward mobile for whom the embrace of modern Hindu piety was a key to their quest for respectability. So, what I'm trying to say is that uh, conspicuous, diverse, and highly public forms of uh, uh, religious institutions, processions, sounds, signs, have shaped the life uh, of large colonial and post-colonial cities uh, uh, for more than a century. I argue that now similar configurations of diverse relig religious and ethnic communities are obviously happening and taking place, uh, jockeying for space, for public expression, increasingly define the urban experience across Europe and North America. Distinct religious communities promote certain codes of conduct, styles of dress, comportment, distinct public lives, styles of consumption, segmented institutions, forms of leisure and performances and so on, often investing heavily 
in shutting out or avoiding unbelievers are merely those who are different from themselves. At the surface of things, this seems to conform entirely to the urban ethnicity hypothesis that I referred to above. Urban life and the intimate encounters with many and powerful others in the city spurs a certain generalization and homogenization of discrete local traditions and customs. These dynamics, in turn, create a form of urban ethnicity that is broad but thin, hinging on a few, uh, hinging on a few and easily shareable traits, language, styles of food, skin color, recognizable dress codes, and so on. So this dynamic of cultural abstraction, you might call it, seems also at first sight to be completely analogous with the more general logics that for Henri Lefebvre and others constitute the very heart of modernity and the capital of the city, the abstraction and objectification of labor, commodities, media images, space, dwellings, rhythms of work, movement in the city, and so on. Many of these logics of standardization and even a certain theological simplification do also apply to religious life in their modern and mediatized form, where the face-to-face -face dynamic of the congregation or the collective prayer are increasingly, and not always, but more and more, substituted by televised or supplemented by televised images, sermons and speeches, on radio, on tapes and other media. However, in my own experience, and when you read people who work on this, nothing suggests that such religious practice or identification or the seriousness of religious belief and attachment is getting any more superficial, quite on the contrary. As we saw in the examples above, when mapped onto spatially distinct historical communities of language, race, class, and so on, religious identity continues to forge very powerful social bonds and solidarities, often also as a form of defense. However, it's neither tradition nor ethnicity, but in fact the new and decidedly modern interpretations of religious idioms that today provide the most appealing and successful styles of ritual and belief across the world. The fastest growing and most powerful religious movements in the 21st century are evangelical Christianity, modern Islamist, Islamism and modern Hindu movements, all decidedly pitched against habitual traditional practice, which they deride as soft, formless, without rigor, contaminated by all forms of cultural accretions. Many religious modernists criticize the ethnic model of religious belief and attachment as insincere, as unreflexively conflating traditions, habits, and uh, of certain communities as proper uh, religious injunctions. One classic example is the modern Islamist critique of Sufi-oriented rituals and beliefs among many Muslims, especially in South Asia, but also beyond. Many Islamists regard the worship and offering at dargahs, the graves of Sufi saints, and the belief in the healing powers of certain verses of the Quran as abominations, as grave worship and superstition imported from Hinduism as a form of excessive cultural pollution of the purity of the doctrines and the truth of Islam. Similarly, evangelical movements in Africa campaign, campaign constantly against heathen practices, against the backsliding of converts into their old uh, beliefs, as well as against local forms of African Christianity that seems in their eyes to be somehow polluted, unclean, way too embedded in cultural traditions and in the worship of false gods, if not the devil. Instead, these movements promote the idea of modern piety as a break with the past, as radical self-invention, internal purification, bodily self-containment, and all the other markers of classically modern virtues. In short, a form of ethicization, you might call, of religion, that pitches religion as a register of ethical certainty against the proliferation of another version of the modern self, the self-reflexive, ironic, hedonistic self that constantly seeks fulfillment and, and expansion of desire. So here we're moving from ethnics to ethics. A word of clarification may be in order here, and I'm coming close to the end here, soon, uh, uh, what the term modern religion signifies in the context of the modern city. So following Talal Assad's critique of Clifford Geert's idea of religion as meaning, as a peculiar Protestant rendition of what constitutes uh, religion, this has almost become 
sort of the standard reference today, much work has gone into denouncing and critiquing the Christocentric understanding of religion as such in the social and human sciences. And I think a, a lot of good work has been done there. This has pertained even more pointedly to the overtly Protestant connotations attached to the notion of modernization of religion, understood as reforms that render pract religious practice more scriptural, more abstract, and more conceptual, and less embodied, ritualized, and also less material. While there's much value in a lot of this work, it's equally indisputable, though, that religious practice across the world, and certainly in cities, in the main, are rendered today ever more abstracted, disembedded, and also portable. Partly through media, but through many of them as well. This process is directly linked to trade, movement, cultural interface, and entrepreneurship, this is, as has been pointed out, for instance, in the, by the historian Nile Green, uh, in his great book, Bombay Islam, he shows how Muslim traders based in Bombay also spread distinct styles of Islam across the Indian Ocean space in the 19th and 20th century. And there is just one example of many you can, you can give of this kind of, of movement. So such portable and media-born religious practices and doctrines are as intensely embodied and believed as older forms of ritual. You shouldn't make that mistake. In a widely cited book, for instance, Sabah Mahmud has shown that religious practices and aspirations among Muslims in modern Cairo are profoundly detained by questions of proper bodily disciplines, proper comportment, and other practical material aspects of life. Yet it's equally clear that among her interlocutors, the word and its meanings remain enormously important. Maybe no longer as conveyors of healing in the direct sense like in Sufi practice, but as conveyors of meanings and deep ethical import that must be contemplated by the individual believer. Charles Hirschkind, in his Ethics of Listening, another widely cited book and very good book, attributes the force of the act of listening to, uh, listening to cassette sermons with Islamic preachers uh, uh, preaching to their sonic and their sensory power. But it's striking, and he doesn't mention that much, that his interlocutors in Cairo are as emphatic in insisting on the moral weight and the fear that the very meaning of the sermon's word and parables instill in them. Similarly, scholarship on global Pentecostal and evangelical revival shows that this movement has two sources, at least. On one hand, Pentecostalism derives a lot of force from a simplified and thin, you might call, thin theology that allows the force and word of God to be abstracted into an omnipresent, versatile, and ever mobile healing and redemptive spirit. You can set up a church anywhere. Call upon the spirit. On the other hand, Pentecostalism also promises bodily immediacy and somatic authenticity, that is, in possession, healing, purification rituals, and so on, as well as powerful promises of this worldly deliverance, such as health and wealth. In a not dissimilar way, many neo-Hindu movements, such as Ishkon, Ramakrishna Mission, Sai Baba, as well as the uh, Swami Narayan sect of Gujarat, mixes both the logic of modernist abstraction of text and doctrine with embodied practice. Hindu myths and teachings are turned into easily portable and translatable forms of everyday ethics and lifestyle advice that are embedded in new and reformed regimes of healthy living, bodily balance, vegetarianism, yoga, and so on. California is full of that stuff, by the way. In some cases, this translates into globalized forms of unexceptional lifestyle communities fueled by the economic enterprise and commercial empires of modern gurus, such as Sai Baba is a, was a, a great business manager more than anything else. In other cases, such religious lifestyles are mapped directly onto regions with a long and entrenched history of Hindu-Muslim conflicts, such as Gujarat. Here, as Hasem Fachandi has shown in a new astounding work called Pogrom in Gujarat, the ethical religious commitment and aesthetic preference for vegetarianism produces profound forms of disgust and fear vis-a-vis -vis non vegetarians that is, Muslims and lower caste Hindus, which in turn easily can be turned into a solid audience for militant nationalism, Hindu nationalism. As Fachandi points out, this religiously infused inju injunction against meat has in cities like Ahmedabad been turned resolutely spatial dividing entire sectors of the city into meat-free zones, defined by upper-caste Hindu residents as safe and modern zones for good people of clean and rational habits, unlike the older and dirty zones of the old city, dominated by minorities and their backward and fanatical attachment 
to traditional religion and community identity. So nothing has really changed in that polarity, but the poles are a little different. Similar dynamics can be observed in contemporary Mumbai, where the remaking of the city by powerful real estate interests has enabled upper caste and upper class residents to purge entire housing colonies and areas, residential areas of non-vegetarians by making vegetarianism a precondition for entry into certain residential areas. This, is, this de facto social and communal segregation is enacted and justified, as it can be, in the name of the right to express and protect religious sensibilities and sentiments that indeed are enshrined in the Indian constitution. So in some ways, this is religious lifestyle uh, in, in a way that maybe that resonates in some ways with what Tony Giddens two decades ago or more called life politics. I hesitate to call any of these developments mere symptoms of the modernity of religion as some sociologists like to do. Religious life has been a part of modernity from the very outset, and we are now at the stage where we can acknowledge that the Weberian model of modernization, that is Protest Protestantization of religion is not adequate. Modernity doesn't just, if at all, produce secularity wall to wall, and many cities do not just produce secular homogenous spaces, but a multiplicity of voices and tendencies. And what's happening across the board seems to be that religious communities are aiming at both being universal, translatable, and portable uh, in the form of ethical values, as well as lifestyles. Religious discourse, symbols, and religious meanings are always embedded and have always been embedded in dense webs of lifestyle and markers that include material objects, commodities, architectural forms and spatial limits that also can be, for instance, violated by other sensory means. In Rio's favelas, competing church communities engage in, in literal sonic wars across these boundaries, as shown by, by Matain Osterban. Um, and um, in northern Nigeria, in Durban and across India, the use of loudspeakers for the Azan remain deeply controversial because it crosses religious boundaries, at times even triggering physical confrontations and, and, and larger, more uh, serious riots. In Kuala Lumpur, in Dubai, in Tehran, and London, a multi-billion halal certification industry is now taking its cues from the global kosher market and is rapidly expanding into new realms. You can now visit halal garden centers, halal services of all kinds in Kuala Lumpur, also in Durban, if you're interested in having a, a halal haircut, I think you can have. Uh, and, and these kind of things, which has been explored by Johann Fischer in a string of studies uh, more recently. Here, very old religious injunctions are commodified, turned into consumer choice, markers of lifestyle, albeit, of course, lifestyles with a difference. So in matters of religion, I'm arguing, and, experience, uh, and also the experience of cultural difference in urban space, it is today, in fact, the modern post-colonial city that's becoming the global norm. Its deep divisions of segmented communities, its deep and fine-tuned sensibilities and hostilities around different and adjacent lifestyles and aesthetic regimes, its competing soundscapes and, and many sounds, it cont its contested and disavowed smells and bodily styles, its privatization of public space in residential colonies and malls, and its apprehensive sharing of shrinking public spaces. If this is so, and I do believe it is so, and I've tried to argue that it is the case, the question of how sacred space and religious identity in particular informs and structures urban experience will have to move right to the center of urban research agendas of the 21st century. Thank you. Thank you very much for that uh, fascinating rooting of the past into the present, the, the there and the here. Because, um, Thomas is uh, happy to answer questions for, uh, for a while, so we've got uh, probably about 20, 20 minutes or so of questions. Anyone want to, to kick off? Um, so first question. Um, I, I have a question. Yes. In fact, it's more of a comment. It might become a question. Okay, let's see how it goes. Um, it's really about time. Isn't yeah. it? Time is all over this, and it's all over this in all sorts of ways. And I, I was thinking, you know, the very terms traditional modernity are sort of laden with complex temporalities and, and so on. And of course, your various vignettes give examples of how the different ways in which people could 
read different temporalities into space or off space, or experience different temporalities of space. Maybe also impose different temporalities in the making of space. But it also occurred to me that the substance of urban landscapes and indeed of bodies have their own kind of temporalities, which both enable these kinds of this time work, if you like, but also maybe defy it. Now, I don't know where it goes from there, so that's kind of my comment, and maybe you can make the question. <laughs> so the question, the question is, but see, temporality, what my, the beef I have with this is, of course, that the temporality that's being talked about, that, that was imposed, was exactly one of a, a beginning with the African material, as you know very well, a kind of timeless time, right, in the village and, or the tradition. And then you have a time where that's the time of modernity where things move and so on. So there's a kind of transposition of this. Of course, Christianity was always exempted from this particular analysis of religion, very interestingly, except in the classical sociology, but it was still rooted in, supposed to be rooted in the countryside. But when you move to the, to the uh, colonial world, re uh, Christianity is strangely exempted from this sort of mapping of, of tradition and modernity. Um, but that's, a, that's one aside. But, so I think the temporality question is, is one I'm sort of protesting and saying, you know, look, the, the whole, the, there's a whole um, set of assumptions that still operate uh, which is that religion belongs to a particular, uh, has certain forms of origin, and it comes from certain, uh, it, it has a historicity of its own that it cannot let go of, right? So this is the problem. This is also the stuff that really, uh, debates are made of. If you walk into a room where modernist uh, Islamists argue against Sufi people, it's all about time, right? It's all about time. If you walk into a room where uh, you know, African uh, people from an African uh, uh, Christian, uh, one of the uh, uh, long-standing churches there, argue with an evangelical preacher. It's all about time, right? So that's what it's about. So I, I think that the, the, the point that I'm trying to make is to say, well, if we, we have to see uh, that this argument about time is constantly being imposed on people, right? Although that it's an intellectual argument that, or a, a sort of conceptual structure that doesn't necessarily attach itself meaningfully to what people do. So my example from Edinburgh with these gentlemen, right, who are perfectly urbane men, some of them from Lahore, which is not exactly a new city. I think I think it was created well before Edinburgh itself. Uh, you know, uh, have this had this sort of. Uh, strange kind of misrecognition of themselves in the eyes of the local public with whom they were interacting very gracefully and so on and so forth. But it's sort of a feeling of being having constantly a temporal structure imposed on you. And, and I think this is, um, and this, this uh, is of course in, in part due to a colonial form of legacy, but it's not only that. I think it's a much larger argument about how religion develops, what religion is, what's its origin, what's its, its purity, and so on and so forth. Because if you take, if you take uh, uh, most of the arguments for modernist religion, right? If you take a Tabliki fellow, or you take an evangelical or whatever, they say this is not, uh, uh, we don't see ourselves as people who are retrieving a thing from the past. The Bible has no age, right? The Quran has no age. It's, ex it's outside of time. It is a form of, of uh, uh, ethical structure that we can draw on regardless. So, so, so it's a very strange, I think, landscape in which this temporality of religion as always harking back to something uh, is constantly imposed on people who, in fact, if you talk to them, will say, no, that's not what I think it is. Is, is, is there not a temporality of speed as well, I think? Yeah. So time becomes speed, and speed and distance become interchangeable in some ways, and what disappears and what appears. And that, that also complicates, does that not complicate some of the things? We've got a queue of people. Sorry. Let's, you may not, you may not want to answer you that. Can bundle, you can bundle questions. But then no, 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 maybe you come back. Come, come, yeah. Come, come back yes. later, but it's a deep that. question, yours. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. um, I was wondering about two things. There was a lot of religion in, in your account, and then very little about the city, actually. 
Um, and on the other hand, some of the pressures you described seem to just be happening in a way. And you weren't quite, you weren't specific because of the nature of the comparison that we were yeah. proposing yeah. about the, yeah. the actual, the kind of dynamics, the, the regulations, the policies that enable some of, or hinder some of the pressures that, yeah. that you were describing. So yeah. I was wondering, trying to bring those two together, and because I'm particularly interested in planning and planners. Yeah. Um, whether, to, whether you could say or give, give a few more specific examples about how some of the people who are, who are in charge of managing the city and kind of trying to define what this city is and, and how it's shaped, yeah. the spatial yeah. forms, etc., yeah. how they deal with some of the processes that, that, that you were describing and, and trying to regulate those or how they feel perhaps that those are obstacles to what they are trying to do. And yeah. I don't know whether you, you work with planners or... or have I haven't worked with planners, but I've worked a lot with the, the, the effect of planning, let's say. So, uh, as one does. So, let me give you two examples from the places I have worked the most, Durban and Bombay. Um, so, in the mid-19th century, there is this, uh, uh, basically after the big, uh, f what people call the first Indian War of Independence, other people call it the Indian Mutiny in 1857, this idea that we uh, Brits are going to back off from questions of religion. We're not going to uh, interfere with that again. Th there was, it was not a good thing. So there's a clear change of policy. It's, it's rare in historical time you have such clear, decisive shifts. The colony gets no longer the, uh, under the East India Company, gets under the crown and so on. What happens there is that there is a decision made to encourage and allow people to govern their own religious property by themselves. So Muslims will be given vak boards that administer Muslim property and, and religious property. It is acknowledged and encouraged that if you have people coming in who want to build a temple, want to build a mosque, yes, let them do it by all means. If they want to build a church, oh yes, by all means, go ahead. Shrines were protected. So secular India has in many ways continued those po policies, right? Because the, se the colonial state was this kind of state that saw itself as looking at Indian society from the sky, and the secular state has in many wa ways done the same, inherited this sort of idea, we are the referee, right? It's a, the referee function of governance. We have to mediate between these communities and so on, which means that we, we uh, wed ourselves to, to protect all religious property, and uh, uh, we will also, but we will make sure that nobody, that when people fight over land, or over uh, uh, whatever identity questions, we will get in and immediate. So this is still the policy. So the, in, the urban, urban landscape I described in Bombay in my little walk is, is entirely shaped by that policy. Um, it was much easier to get permission for any kind of charitable institution than for virtually any other building. So you can say there's even been a certain proliferation of those kinds of institutions in some areas because it's been your tax exempt, uh, you will not be interfered with, you can get planning permission more easily because you don't want to offend the sensibilities of the religious community in that area and so on. So this is, this is a very important piece. That policy, as you know, most of the imperial policies uh, in the British Empire were tried out and failed and tried out again in India and then exported to the rest of the world, uh, the rest of the colonial world. So in South Africa, you have a, have a variety of the same thing, where when you lay out for all its, you know, it's very interesting. You go to Durban, you see all these places that were raised to the ground when you, you move people out in the townships and moved a lot of communities, Africans and Indians, out in new townships. The one thing you did not touch were the old temples. Uh, so you have all these old derelict temples, or some of them are still functioning in the middle of industrial estates. Uh, and people still go and have festivals and all that kind of stuff. So even at the height of the repression of apartheid, that was never interfered with. Uh, and these townships were laid out with specific areas and specific uh, um, 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 plots and, and so on and so forth. It's a very active kind of uh, attempt to map that on to, to, uh, to the planning process. But it's really talked about as a kind of you know, uh, way in which people also meaningfully inhabit the space. If you talk to people, this is something that comes very strongly out of the work I did in, in Chatsworth. What I was mentioning, this the last example with people engaging in these sort of wars of sonic wars with one another about you know the singing and do you have a loudspeaker, how loud should it be, and that kind of thing. It's very much about staking claims to that territory. Whose is it, right? Um, and how can you inhabit it, and so on and so forth. And this is, I think, in a, in a fundamental experiential way in which uh, the way in which people also have lived and inhabited that landscape. Um, 
for a very long time. And I, I'm, I, I'm, what I'm trying to say is that that has to be factored in when we discuss urban dynamics because it affects, as I was trying to indicate, also how property markets function, for instance. Property markets are never free. We know that they're the least free of all commodity markets in the world. Uh, but they are definitely very deeply structured by some of these, uh, many of them of colonial provenance, some of these boundaries, definitions, institutions, and so on. Um, and it's still factored in. It's still factored in when, you know, when you make, I was just doing new field work in India uh, in an old uh, city that uh, was built uh, for 500 years ago, and they're trying to, to uh, implement a new master plan that was, uh, that's been developed. And they raised 2,000 houses to the ground in less than a month. A uh, huge uproar in the city. The only thing they, so you have these widened streets and in the middle of them, you have an old Dorga sitting there. You, next to you, you have a little temple. So the, the cars are driving like this in between because they cannot touch them because they don't know what to do with it because the rationality of the state is still fundamentally structured in such a way you can't do it. And after the race into the ground of the Babri Masjid in Ayodhya in 92, you're not gonna touch another mosque again. Mm -hmm. ah. But yeah, thanks for reminding me of the question. Enjoyed the real kind of tour de force. And this is a sort of common belief, but it, I just want to know what you think. I mean, you, in the first part, you, you s as it were, outline the ways in which you feel that these kind of Durkheimian turnies and distinctions between the traditional and modern, mm -hmm. between the rural mm -hmm. and the urban, etc., are still being perpetuated. Right. Yeah. And you gave some counterexamples, but on the whole, I felt that you said, well, I mean, Michael made reference to this in his, his opening remark, his remarks after he finished speaking about it, could open the door the other way and look, take us in a different direction. Yeah. But it, to me, you ended up comparing, as it were, classical Western sociology about Western cities with a newer anthropology of critically colonial, post colonial cities. Yeah. And that has one effect, which is that previously entrenched structures, as you say, in terms of residential neighborhoods by, say, Hindu and Muslim, yeah. perpetuate. Yeah. But I was wondering what about other kinds of cities and urban spaces, such as those being looked at by uh, Vertebeck and his colleagues in the Super University Project, or the sociology group at Lancaster looking at everyday religion, whereby they decided to set aside notions of brand name religions. Yeah. Instead, just look at religious practice, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. And so in the Lancaster project, for example, they looked at people you know, into Reiki and faith healing sure. and tarot card reading sure. and just look at this religion everywhere. <coughs> it's, there's a, 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 the, it's a, the place is awash with religion yes. and supernatural religion. As well as there being churches surrounded by good congregations, Catholics or Protestants or whatever. Yes. And I wonder whether you might find some space in your overview for the everyday practices of religiosity that don't necessarily call it brand name religion. Sure. Sure. No, I mean, your first point, I think it's, of course, it's a sort of slightly uh, easy point to make. I mean, I'm, uh, that to say that this structure, the, the sort of modernity tradition, I think it's, it's, it has structured uh, scholarship for a very, very long time. Um, and, and I think it's, uh, uh, you're completely right in pointing out that there's also new it's an unfair thing to, to look at the sort of state-of-the-art stuff that's coming out of, of say, the southern metropolis and, and comparing it with, with the sociology of, of America or Britain of yesteryear. There's new stuff going on. You're absolutely right that there is um, religiosity everywhere. My, my proposition here is in some ways to say, look, uh, how can we think, what work do we need to do in order to get questions of religion back into the map of the urban. And in order to do that, what, what one can sort of go back and say, how did it become like this? How did, how did it become like I began with this sort of slight puzzlement that you're going to talk about these two categories that don't necessarily seem to belong together. Uh, how did that happen in the first place? So I totally agree that, that, that there are other ways of, of doing this. And I think if one is going to look at what religiosity means around here or in London or whatever, or in Bombay? In Bombay, yes. They're into Reiki and faith healing. Well, they are. They are, they are into all kinds of things. And that, that's also part of it. But um, uh, I, I, the, the most, I think, it, it rarely crosses the established boundaries, you can say. 
So many of these new forms of religiosity, for instance, they, um, um, they happen within the milieus that are already sort of attuned to cosmopolitanism, to a certain kind of new Hindu way of thinking, not wedded to a particular kind of uh, 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 tradition uh, that they uh, might invoke. The, the, moment, the interesting moment there is about conversion. Uh, and that's a big controversy across India. There's big controversy about conversion in the township I worked in in South Africa. There's big, conversion is always the, the big moment, right? Uh, because that's exactly where you have either conversion to something that's a new sect or whatever. Now the outrage is about Scientology or, you know, whatever. Um, uh, um, is it a proper religion? Can it receive? Uh, there's been these debates in, in parts of Europe, maybe also in Britain. I'm not, I don't know whether some of these constitutes, uh, some of these new movements actually are proper religions that can, that can have tax breaks and, you know, the, all this stuff, right? So it matters. Uh, but in India and, and, and the places I have worked, uh, there the conversion is always a conversion uh, issue, where, the, the, um, where there's issue of betrayal or issue of, of dominance or whatever, or, or uh, attempts to keep people within, within their flock. So I think, uh, I mean, all in principle, I'm all for looking at everyday religion without necessarily looking at the nice thing, the, the, the fact of the matter is just that in the places I have worked, the sort of the labels that are not necessarily precise labels. What does it mean to be a Hindu anyway? You know, it means that you're not a Muslim. It means that you're not a Christian. You're not, you know, it's a kind of residual category. It's not a very precise category, but it still defines a sort of realm within p which people feel that they can safely move in times of crisis, at least. And so it's hard to get away from them. Yeah. 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 Two factors. Um, one is how much difference does it make from the centre if you have a genuinely secular state, yes. or if you have, um, you know, like this one, which claims to be a Christian country, or a, or a Hindu farm dominated, yep. which luckily hasn't happened, or a Muslim state, or anything like that. Right. How much difference does that make? To to what? And to to the sociology of, of the okay. 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 in, 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 in the city. Um, and the other is, there is quite a strong movement, not, I think, anywhere near as far as it should be, between the faiths, of actually learning how to work together and respect each other. How much difference does, is that likely to be able to make? Mm -hmm. And perhaps those two things go together, I don't know. So on the, uh, the question of what is a properly, what's a proper secular state, I mean, this is something that's been debated for a long time. Uh, my argument is that um, I think secularism has been sold in the outside of Europe as something Europe has that never, it's a kind of, there's a kind of uh, uh, fundamental misrecognition of the nature of secularity. Uh, so uh, the only places where secularism has been invoked with some, apart from France, where secularity is of course laïcité, which is in some ways a, 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 a limited form of secularism that only ex that only has to do with what people do in the public realm or the realm of the state. Um, uh, to the most expansive sort of project, which is of course the Turkish uh, 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 or other uh, attempts to to create secular states, uh, uh, there it's very interesting, both in France and Turkey, to take those examples that in order to be properly secular, you have to properly regulate the the communities. There is no way, nowhere else where communities are more tightly and precisely regulated in terms of space, um, practices, finances, and so on than exactly in Turkey and in France, where the whole ministries that do nothing about this. This you won't find in India, which is a soft secular state, which is basically a, you know, a referee state, as I say. Uh, this question of there's been a lot of attempts to, uh, not just in, in India, which I know best, but uh, there are other places where there's been these attempts to create um, sort of understanding or inter-community initiatives and so on, or, or even interfaith uh, things uh, like that. It's in fact completely one of the complete sort of uh, standard responses whenever there is an, a crisis of any kind both, uh, in fact, in Nigeria, but also in, in India and, and other places, that when a crisis, when a riot happens, 
state officials will invite senior members of both communities to come in, make speeches, appeal to uh, let reason prevail and, and that kind of thing. That happens all the time. Um, and, and, uh, but I, it's, very, it's not very effective. It doesn't really address any of the issues because the issues are very often not really about, I mean, the, there's something that triggers it. Someone is provoking something, but it, it's not really about uh, always a specific insult or a specific transgression. It's, it's about fighting out an ongoing war that's been going on for a long time. And that's how the members of, this is what I worked on for years, this is how people talk about it. They talk about it as a war. This is the term used. So I'm, it hasn't been very effective, uh, the, 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 the attempts to do that. The, uh, and what people there themselves ask for and, and what lots of people in India but also in Nigeria and elsewhere uh, talk about is that we need, we don't really need necessarily peace brokering between communities. We need the state to come in to create order. It's very interesting. Uh, this is from both communities. Is there an issue about what, 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 what is privileged in, in what you see and what, what gets obscured though, when you put that particular pair of glasses on? In a sense, I was, I was once in a, um, in a minor political role when that was the bombings of the 7th of July in London. Yes. And uh, stood in front of banks and banks of cameras. Um, the, on the other side of the cameras were a few minor politicians, but also the, the Moscow. Who, uh, whose presence had, in a sense, was it, was it, for all sorts of reasons, they can pull a crowd. Yeah. But also alongside the mosque folk were the uh, sort of superannuated vicars and priests and rabbis sure. who sure. normally kind of inhabited uh, vast spaces with empty pews. We saw this particular moment. <laughs> there was an audience was a, there. An, an occasion on, on which there was a kind of revalorization of the yeah. interfaith based on a particular uh, spectral regime of seeing faith through the city. So yeah. I was just wondering, in, in, in a sense, whether by, there's a kind of Heisenberg effect, <coughs> by looking for the, the religious presence, it becomes, I mean, your own work, you've talked about the city as being incalculable, ungovernable, yeah. as in some sense unknowable. Yeah. If one takes a pair of glasses out and marks religious faith, then certain things are privileged. But also other absolutely, things are absolutely, and this is and just, part of the point. It, yeah. This is part of the point, and this is part of the mapping that people also provide, and this is exactly what, what many of the religious institutions do. That they are into counting, knowing, not only their own flocks, but also potential converts or people they can reach out to or align themselves with, and so on and so forth. Very much so. And it's very much a specialized uh, imagination of how to dominate the city or have a presence in the city, and so on. Absolutely. And this is... Uh, uh, I mean, in my own work, this is what these very aggressive uh, majoritarian forces that I worked with, what they were doing um, as a kind of symbolic conquest of the city and so on and so forth. Uh, but even at, in a much lower register of sort of everyday interaction, um, the, the very the, the, the conspicuous kind of uh, display of... of, uh, of uh, Billboards of uh, all kinds of, of ways to announcing that we are here. We may only be three people, but we have we have created something. Uh, we have created a building. We are decorating or decorating your house in a very conspicuous way, uh, as belonging to a minority community, for instance, is also a way of uh, of announcing um, and making either people feel uneasy or at ease. Um, so, so this is, but then of course in, in a city like Bombay or uh, many other cities in South Asia, there's another, the symbolic has also turned into something that is really about physical security beyond the symbolic, right? I mean, it's, it's also a question of a simple calculation that people engage in to say, okay, so this happened in the adjacent neighborhood. People got burned and killed. Next time they're going to come for us. So we are not going to do that. We're going to move out to that area where there are lots of, people of our kind, and this is what has happened. I'll give you a chance to come back, I have <laughs> one more here. Uh, we, okay. we have uh, exercised our, our speaker to the, I think, no, the, the reasonable no, no. The, the limits of uh, what the hospitable might demand, I think. So we, we could just take a final, uh, a final round of kick-off. Oh, yeah. oh, only that I think that you've... Uh,
Well, the, the whole Gandhian movement, and to some extent that does still work in India, and, and the whole of the movements towards uh, a secular state which, which uh, respects all religions yeah. and religions who, who respect each other, yeah. it is actually going on. It I hope it much more strongly than you have implied, <coughs> because I have actually given my life to it. No, I, I have more to say about it. I have more to say about it. Okay. And then two, and then three. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thanks. It's really related to the conversation we just had now. Of course, religion is a very modern conception in itself. So in this sense, I think it's probably not a surprise for us to see uh, religion has the most uh, developed form and expression in cities. Uh, so actually, as your talk has shown, I think very powerfully, urban religion is basically a reification of religion. Right? So therefore, leads to all these kind of conflict, etc. So my question is, instead of uh, the effort of bringing religion back to the city, because I mean, in my framework, probably religion is always in the city, but they're both part of the identity. Instead of asking that question, do you think actually we have a very interesting opportunity here? You know, this kind of global form, this kind of new uh, uh, religious life and faith in city, the different parts of the world, actually provide us the opportunity to rethink of the concept, the conception of religion. It itself altogether. I mean, you didn't define what mm. religion is mm. actually precisely, mm. because we never had the concept of religion until the 1930s in China after practicing, you know, for 4,000 years yeah. or all kinds of things. And of course, India, etc. Uh, you don't. In this sense, actually, Christianity is part of modernity from from the colonialist point of view, because there was no religion even to start with. Right. Anyway, so should we rethink the concept of religion altogether? Me. Um, it's uh, just very interesting. You're talking about all the cities all over the world, and uh, it, in the back of my mind, I was remembering what happened in Oxford a few years ago, when uh, around Cowley, uh, the Muslim community wanted to announce their azan, mm. and all the councillors and the Cowley residents they all went up in arms, and it was about the sounds of the city. Yeah. So they are they are used to having church bells ring because yeah. that blends with what Oxford is. Yes. But to have suddenly an azan and the loudspeaker would break that sound. And I thought that's very interesting. That city is not just kind of architecture, but they're kind of soundscapes and how that is seen by the residents. Yeah. It was not that they were against the Muslim community, but they didn't want that kind of clash of soundscape. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, thank you. Uh, no, I think sound is incredibly interesting. I was just at a panel we had uh, in a different conference. It was all about religious sounds, basically, with examples of people working in Turkey and uh, Minneapolis and, you know, uh, Colombia and God knows where. And it, it, was, it was all about, uh, in a sense, the, the sonic as a form of medium that is, seems to carry a particular kind of... Uh, of weight and a particular kind of charge, right? Because it comes into your house, you can't shut it out. These are the complaints I also listened to in the township I lived in, and I, I lived ne next to uh, um, what people call a happy clappy church, you know, and, and they were very, very loud, also in late in the evening and all that kind of stuff, so people complained about it. So it is really something that is, the, uh, in a sense, the unwanted intrusion. Uh, so I think there's something interesting about it. I, I think much more work has to be done. I'm in many ways a great fan of Charles Hershkin's book on Cairo, on, on the cassette sermons. I, I think he misses the point, as I was trying to indicate, by saying it's only about the sound and not about what people say. Because when you listen to a sermon, it's not about the sound, it's actually about what's being said. And the people he interviews also all the time talk to him, if you check in the book, what they were saying, less than how they were saying it. So. Anyway, so I think a lot more needs to go into it, but it's definitely, uh, uh, in, especially in, in the urban context, a very, very pertinent point. This has been, for instance, in India, again, this sort of old colonial laboratory, this has been legislated by and intervened in and contemplated and mulled over by colonial officials since the 1820s in South India, where people complained about temple bells and whatnot. This is an old story. It's still one of the most... Uh, uh, controversial points. Uh, re rethinking of religion, yes, uh, definitely. Uh, I think, I, I don't think I would ever venture a sort of proper definition of what religion really is or what the limits of it may be. Um, 
I think religion pretty much is what people say it is. And I think the fact that people are declaring something to be religion is the interesting point. You're absolutely right that religion becomes a legitimate category. I mean, again, India is an even better example than China in some ways because there was no Hinduism until, you know, all the Sanskritists went to work and whatever, and, and the modern reformers and so on, the 19th century came up with this thing, uh, which is well established, uh, except among Hindu nationalists, of course. But um, <laughs> no one around here? No? Okay. So, uh, 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 clearly, so, so there is a particular legitimacy tied to questions of religion. And it's very interesting if you go back also in anthropology, you take uh, Evans Pritchard's work on newer religion, right? What he does at the end of the book is to say, well, is this so, after having described all these things that are beliefs and, and so on, and, and uh, 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 at great length. And then in the end he says, is this really a kind of religion? No, I think it's a branch of what he would call African philosophy, right? Which is cosmological in, in character, which uh, is uh, based on allusion rather than conceptual precision. And those, it's a very revealing few pages where in a sense he says, no, what you have is something, philosophy, we can call it that, but it's not religion because religion is something else. Um, so there's a particular charge to, to the word itself that, that connotes a certain kind of coherence, a certain kind of doctrinal uh, um, um, center, an ethic, a, a, a capacity to, you know, to produce, as it were, ethical positions in the world about the world and all that kind of stuff. This is what interfaith dialogues are made of. Not everybody gets invited. The Scientologists don't show up. They would love to be invited. They don't come. Uh, well, they come, came, they would come if they were invited. Uh, so there are many, you know, the Baha'is and so on, you know, the, the, uh, so, so for me religion is pretty much, I think it's an ethnographic fact, as it were, right, the claim itself. And then it come, we come to what we were just talking about, how do you then get valorized as a religion and with that comes a set of claims and a certain legitimacy and so on and so forth. So this is one set of debates. and. You're right that a lot of that has happened in cities, not just in cities, this has happened in many, many places. Many big mystical movements, whatever, have started somewhere else that were not in the city. And I think there's a, in many um, traditions, such as in the Hindu tradition, for instance, a very deep idea that renewal doesn't come from the city because the city is a, is a, is a place of maya, of illusion, of, you know, it comes from the, somewhere else. It comes from solemn contemplation by certain people, very deep uh, thought, and so on and so forth. So, uh, so, so I think, yes, we need something else, perhaps as a conceptual for us, but I'm very, very happy with using religion as a descriptor, as it were, of what people say they do, uh, and the way in which people they claim to be a proper religion, and this is a religious duty, this is a religious injunction, this is my is an ethical claim I ground in this and that. I think that's, that's what we have to work with, and that's the, our questions. And from where do you go from that? You know? and, and many people will have their stones or do healing or whatever, and they wouldn't call it religion, they would call it beliefs. It's up to us whether we call it a re religion. I'm personally most, because I'm interested in public conflicts, right, fundamentally. Uh, so I'm most interested in the moments when people claim it's religion. And it does something, right? Anyway, I don't know if that's an answer. The Gandhian, the Gandhian tradition, yes, it's very well and alive. Now there was even a latter-day Gandhi uh, appearing last summer in, in Delhi uh, as this retired, <laughs> retired uh, military man who tried to play Gandhi for a few days. Um, so there's uh, some purchase. There's a lot of uh, f uh, symbolic force in that. So while I think Gandhism as a political force may have failed some, somewhat. I mean, the last big attempt was in the 70s, right? The ethos, a certain kind of that ethos, which is not necessarily Gandhi's invention, but he was sort of more or less saying, you know, equal respect for all religions, that's the formula. Uh, that is not just the reason of state, which it is, but it's, it's uh, the most commonly endorsed thing that people will tell you. And it, it's, I was for a long time very skeptical about this because I, my work in India was at a time of enormously sharpened conflict and heightened conflict. Uh, 
But I've come to the conclusion this is what people really do, truly do believe should happen. Um, and they truly do desire a kind of recognition and respect from other communities. The problem is it's very difficult to generate by yourself. Right? You need a kind of referee function. You need various kinds of... And, and, and I think the time of the... Uh, the, 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 the time of when, when a retired professor from a university would take off his shoes and dress up in Gandhian garb and go to warring communities and, 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 uh, and uh, tell them, please... It happened. It actually happened like that. I'm sure you're aware. <laughs> and it was effective up to a point because there was a certain authority in this gesture, right? But that authority doesn't really exist anymore. But I think the common sense as a kind of model of coexistence, ideally, does exist. Now it's just people like it to be enforced by, I don't know, a policeman or the army, the army perhaps, or something like that. But there, it's, it's, it's very, uh, I think it's a, it's a, it's a kind of uh, divided legacy in some ways.